All right, here we are, Chapter 18, Nomadic Empires and Eurasian Integration. I'm going to go through the first heading and its first subheading, which is uh, Turkish Migrations and Imperial Expansion, and this is Nomadic econ Economy and Society. Um, more so than any other group of people that we've learned about so far, um, the nomadic people are really going to be based off of their interaction with the environment. When we're talking about nomads too, we aren't just talking about Mongols, we're talking about all the different groups that are nomads, um, specifically here in Central Asia. Now, the geography of Central Asia is not a lot of rainfall, a lot of hills and mountains, but a lot of grasslands as well. So the people are able to make a society out of this, but it's based off of grazing animals. Okay, so they're uh, a pastoral people. Um, so, and animals are central to everything, their food, their clothing, how they make shelter, and they're nomads, which doesn't mean they just wander around just willy-nilly. They migrate in specific patterns to make sure that they never um, have their herds overeat the pasture land and therefore disappears and therefore they disappear. Um, so there is going to be some small-scale uh, farming, some rudimentary uh, artistry, and so uh, but basically a lot of the time is going to be spent moving place to place. Um, this is called a yurt. Uh, so you can see it's a, basically a, a, a large tent is basically the easiest way to put it. You don't see a lot of it in California. You do see them in some of the northwest and midwest parts of the United States, kind of like a, a summer house. Okay. Uh, when it comes to their economy, it was really based as uh, based with the sedentary people as they would travel around. Uh, nomads were ideal to do the long distance travel in caravan routes. So some of the largest, toughest. Um, Areas across Asia would be done by these nomadic people who were so good traversing the, traversing the terrain. The other thing that's interesting about their societies is they're very clan-based, which means kind of family-based and extended family-based. And also, because they're living off of the land, um, the noble class is going to be very fluid. Um, and that's going to be because... Uh, when you are out in the midst of the wilderness, your leader has to be good. If your leader stinks in, say, our society, then life becomes hard for, for some people. Um, if your leader is bad, if you're living as a nomad, then everyone dies. And so what would happen is, is that charismatic individuals would rise up. They would become the noble. They, would, they could pass down their, their power to generations. But if those generations weren't as good as they were, then they would be uh, they would lose their place, and other uh, commoners would rise up. When it comes to the religion, there was a lot of shamans um, that were a part of a, a lot of different nature-based religious thoughts. Uh, they would uh, infuse things like Buddhism, Western Christianity, Islam, Manichaeism. Um, however, what's going to happen is their center is going to be on their, uh, their shamanistic beliefs. Uh, we think that the first Turkish script was developed probably to help record the religious teachings. However, by the 10th century, a lot of these nomadic peoples in Central Asia are going to convert to Islam due to the Abbasid Empire. Usually what would happen is, is that all these different nomadic groups uh, could form a confederation under a Khan or a great leader, and then, his, then your individual tribe would have its own tribal elders. In general, they were very strong and well-regarded fighters because of their strong cavalries. Cavalries is basically horse plus soldier. And so that's uh, going to make these soldiers incredibly fast and incredibly mobile, very hard, very hard to hit and able to go through a lot of terrain that normal soldiers would find impossible. And that is subheading number one.